morning. This is Dr. John Bennett uh, for the Neurosurgical TV. We're interviewing John Adler, a real innovator, a gentleman that invented the cyber knife, uh, and then he went about changing uh, public pu uh, publication, in neuro mostly in neurosurgery, I believe, initially with Curious, an online uh, publication company, and John's going to talk about that. And uh, John's been with us for a while. He used to do Hangouts before Zoom. So that shows you that he's willing to try new stuff. Okay, anyways, welcome, John, and it's all yours. Hey, thank you, John, and uh, delight to be here this morning and describe what we've been doing here with Curious um, here in Silicon Valley. So um, uh, I've been a lifelong academic, as you know. Um, uh, you don't get to be a Stanford professor without uh, contributing a fair amount to the medical literature. And uh, in that process, I well, fell in love with the medical literature and, and totally dismayed and disappointed by how poorly it serves humanity today. And uh, out of that kind of disgust as rose curious uh, more than 10 years ago. And I'm excited to kind of give everybody an update and try to tell them why Curious is so different and invite people to use Curious in the future. So, uh, yeah, we're trying to not just disrupt, but literally blow up all traditional academic publishing. And my goal is in a few years to really dominate the medical journal world. And we've made a lot of progress, as you'll see, and uh, invite all of you to uh, Pay attention here as we seek to eliminate barriers to the generation, curation, and dissemination of medical knowledge, especially neurosurgical medical knowledge. So the importance of, of journals in today's world cannot be, you know, overestimated. I mean, the the role of most story journals, you know, Lancet, JAMA, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, in making and guiding uh, the most significant social decisions in the world today uh, is just fact. Um, we've all lived through this period of COVID and none of the major public health decision-making uh, was done without documented uh, evidence published in journals. Journals have driven so much of modern decision-making. And uh, there's a reason for that. I mean, peer review is timeless. The notion of discerning truth not just by virtue of someone throwing it up and putting it on paper or publishing online, but by passing through a filter of peer review uh, leads to a much better capacity to find truth than any other process that we currently have in the world today. And that's why people trust journals um, for good reason. And uh, so we believe, and I've always believed in journals, I've always believed in peer review. It's just that what's happened to journals is that they've gotten so uh, caught up and trapped by more than just the peer review process. And it's really been an inhibition to the generation and dissemination of medical knowledge today. So, um, so what's wrong? Well, you know, there's a lot of things wrong with the journal world. It has really become a domain of the elites. It is disproportionately, not always, but disproportionately, 1% uh, of the practicing physicians in the world communicating with one another. It's disproportionately Harvard speaking to UCSF, speaking to UCLA, you know, speaking to Emory, um, and, and Oxford and Cambridge, and you know, a half the University of Tokyo. And, and sure, there is a the modern journal world serves the wealthiest, wealthiest and most connected and most prestigious institutions well. In fact, that's probably its primary reason for existence in many respects. And not only that, it makes lots of money along the way. It doesn't just keep this knowledge among themselves, but if you want to tap into this knowledge, it's going to char cost a lot of money. The uh, academic journals have some of the highest profit margins of any business in the world today. And their profit margins are even greater than Facebook, which is arguably the best set of profit, profit engine in the world. So these are not only inefficient, but extremely profitable 
And they really serve, again, the domain of the wealthy. And even the wealthy are finding they're having trouble paying for these journals today. Harvard and Stanford, they pay, oh, close to $10 million a piece. These are expensive kind of uh, services for even wealthy universities to afford, much less the common man, the common physician in the world today. So the process by which journals peer review, while it has implemented internet practices, it's foundationally no different than it was, you know, 100 years ago, except we've replaced snail mail with internet and, uh, and browser-based tools. Um, it is unfortunately an impediment to the faster dissemination of medical knowledge. And we've seen the value of faster medical knowledge generation and dissemination in the last couple of years or in and around COVID. And then lastly, the, the journals are obsessed with status, obsessed. This impact factor concept is, is, is truly a, a, an obsession <laughs> because they um, have built brands that they cherish more than the knowledge within. So journals believe that they create knowledge that they're responsible for this knowledge, not the, not the authors themselves. And the sad reality is, is that there's a competition to be more and more prestigious, get a higher and higher impact factor. And what that means is oftentimes ignoring very important science. So in the New England Journal of Medicine, they, they describe some of the most important discoveries that were reported in the New England Journal of Medicine over the years. And sadly, some of the most important observations they made would never be published today. For example, anesthesia, the idea of anesthesia being first done at Mass General being reported in the England Journal of Medicine would not be published today because it was a clinical antidote. It wouldn't be have passed through their litmus test of being a randomized blinded clinical trial. Moreover, there's a range of other just clinical observations and I'm gonna to point to others that would not be published today in current medical journals that in hindsight, we look at as being some of the most foundational developments in healthcare over the last two centuries. This is a case in point, this is MIS-2. MIS-2 is uh, a product of observational medicine over generations. And uh, she was the one that basically discovered statins and also discovered some, uh, uh, I think, the schistosomiasis drugs. So, and she did this very systematically, but not in a way that would ever excite big journals. And yet today, we all say, oh, she's a genius as she wins the Nobel Prize. So, um, sadly, journals are unable, because of their arcane processes, able to recognize genius. They're more able to recognize the, the conventional wisdom of the, of the elites. And uh, we believe, I believe that there is a wisdom in the crowd, a wisdom in the democratization of medical knowledge. And certainly Ms. Two's Nobel laureate, Nobel Prize demonstrates how just collectively there is a wisdom among the, the masses of physicians and researchers. So I'm um, curious is set out to be something very, very different. We're next generation medical journal. And that means a lot of things to a lot of people, but it is primarily is dedicated to being by far the lowest cost, if not free to publish. It goal is to be free to all people, but most authors have trouble complying with, with our, uh, our templated guidelines and end up having to pay some money. But one third of authors will end up paying for nothing, pay nothing, publish for free, and can literally publish within a couple of weeks. Uh, the whole peer review publication process can literally take a couple of weeks. Importantly, Curious is dedicated to all specialties. The idea, while I love the specialty of neurosurgery, it is clearly, in many cases, there, especially if you're doing spine surgery, not that far removed from orthopedics. Or if you're doing peripheral nerve surgery, not that far from plastic surgery and hand surgery. Um, or if you're treating degenerative diseases for some way where you're going to be want to know about neuro what's going on in neurology. You know, if you're treating, you know, 
um, disease of the odontoid. You may want to be commuting, com uh, communicating with rheumatologists or taking care of re rheumatological diseases. So the point is that medical knowledge doesn't exist in these discrete little silos. The way journals have structured themselves is they have been communication vehicles oftentimes for medical societies and a way for medical societies to make money and to preserve the status. And really they're like, and medical societies are a little more than medical unions that preserve the socioeconomic well-being of the specialty. Well, medical knowledge should go everywhere. Medical knowledge is created by the world and it should be, has its, its place in the world. And we feel very strongly that that is the function of Curious, to democratize medical knowledge, both as generation and dissemination. Um, we also have this unique post-publication crowdsourcing. So after journals, after articles are peer-reviewed, and eventually published. And by the way, we focus on peer review, not peer rejection. So if the article is credible, even if it's not important, it is suitable for publication. Its importance though, its importance, and the world wants an importance measure, is not measured by impact factor, it's measured by what we call SIQ, scholarly impact quotient. And we find that after an article is read and scored by an adequate number of readers, you really do find a very good measure of what the article quality is. Importantly, Curious is open access. So there's zero paywalls. So under the Creative Commons license, anybody can read our article for free. In fact, anybody can use the images or figures within our articles as long as they give credit to where they found that information. So that's very much what we, the modern internet is based on this Creative Commons license. So we have tried to, as much as possible, charge authors next to nothing. And in part, we're able to do that by virtue of our close connection with life science companies. And we also work closely with academic departments where we allow them to have what we call an academic channel, which is like a YouTube channel, except it focuses very much on published science, published research, that comes out of a, a given academic department or in several cases, medical schools. And we have about 60 now plus of these academic channels, all reaching from around the world and all different continents. And, um, but in the end, we see our capacity, the strength of our business and what we're creating is not just a content generation opportunity, but an opportunity to network for all physicians to network among each other. That's many ways where the greatest value. So medical knowledge is different than the internet in general. There's a potential, as we all know, to put up fake science and that fake science can have consequences. It can lead to serious injury. We've seen the last couple of years, all the fake news in and around COVID. Well, here we, continue to believe that peer review is the best way to minimize that fake news, that fake content. And we're dedicated to that through peer review. But we then also enable the digitalization of all this communication. As you'll find, our process for publishing embodies some of the coolest technologies that we know of in the internet today. We, as you'll see, embody things like uh, um, into a turbo tax, uh, things like Facebook, as I'll be describing. So we take the best of digital internet technologies and merge them with the publication process. And of course, we're in Silicon Valley, so that's kind of almost is first nature. And we've done this to make it as affordable as possible. Even if you're one of the people at Curious that must pay to publish your article because you can't comply by yourself with the standards, editorial standards, the formatting standards, you still pay only 10% of what it would cost to publish in a Frontiers article. So even if, even if you have to pay, it's, it's, highly, it's highly affordable. And after a few times, generally you can do this by yourself and you don't have to pay at all. So highly affordable by virtue of all the technology we've incorporated in this platform. So technology makes it affordable and also makes it faster. As I said, our common, 
We commonly publish in just a few weeks, as most journals, a few months, if not more. And then lastly, we make this content available to the world. And several of our articles are approaching a million reads, a million reads. That doesn't happen in any medical journal today. But when the, concept, when the inter topic is interesting enough, our, our, base, our ability to distribute that content is unparalleled, and we reach a very large audience. So this is how we're eliminating barriers to the generation, curation, and dissemination of medical knowledge. So again, authors are published through a very sophisticated internet platform that is template driven and literally by answering a few questions, pulling down a few menus and clicking on a few buttons, then of course, taking some content that you've written in a Microsoft Word document or something similar, one can literally in 15 minutes stitch together a very nice looking HTML page. And we even have reference checkers that help you get the right references. We have spell checkers that help you with their spelling. Not, we can't do everything for you, but we can do a lot of the fundamentals of writing a good article. And if you're conscientious enough, almost every author can write a good article and publish for free. Now, if you can't follow our rules, you're going to end up paying something, but it is the lowest cost, almost 10% of what the general industry would charge you if you were to publish with them. Once your article is published, and it can be in a matter of days, it happened. We've had one article get published in two days, and it's may someday uh, one of the authors may someday win a Nobel Prize for the way. Um, so, uh, but the point is that it's very efficient, and one can do this with if one's conscientious. After publication, the articles are subjected to community review through what we call SIQ, and that SIQ value becomes a measure of journal of article quality, not journal quality. We understand some of our articles are not so important, but some are extremely important, and that's what SIQ is intended to discern. So this is kind of the flow chart by which an article comes in, is we make initial assessment whether, I mean, whether an article has any potential to be sufficient. Sadly, and it's hard for me to understand, how some people in the world really don't take this publication process seriously, seriously, and they put up something that is really a piece of crap. It doesn't deserve much respect. And so we're forced right out of the gate to, to reject some articles that are just literally terrible. But once an article is demonstrated to have a conscientious author done a credible work of inputting using our templated platform, uh, we suggest the article to a, a single blind peer review. And uh, there's an opportunity for authors to go through a second peer review once the first set of comments come back. Um, everything is extremely automated through web browsers. So the, the actual reviewer tool is unlike anything else in the journal world today. It's like, like sitting there and marking up an article that has been written by one of your students. Um, and because it's so streamlined and so efficient, reviewers are much more likely and much more willing to do it faster and, and just to publish in the first place, to review an article in the first place. The net effect is everything is more efficient. And when everything is more efficient, an author remembers what's been going on, doesn't have to go back and go back, to re retrieve primary sources that they once had. So the entire publication process by being faster feeds on itself and gets faster and faster and faster. And truly my goal is to make this whole publication process literally someday in just a few hours. There's no reason it has to take as long as it does today. Now we understand that sometimes reviewers are not available. Okay, so we have a process by which we invite more reviewers. And so only those reviewers that are available need to do it. And uh, that process leads to faster publication process, but also helps us generate a larger and larger community. And it is the size of the community, the network effect that we think is something very special that we have here. Now I mentioned SIQ and I'm gonna just say it again. Um, 
it is a tool for building community engagement, but it's a tool for understanding article quality. We're deep into getting our own impact factor. We have a, an unofficial impact factor of about one today. We're expecting to get an official impact factor in the next year or two, having gone through the, we're in Clarivate's kind of uh, um, advanced journal category where we're weighting that impact factor. But impact factor is only a reflection of the importance of the journal or so-called importance of the journal, but it doesn't reflect the art importance of the article. And SIQ does that. Readers are invited to score the article on a range of different measures. And collectively, we put together a score that we refer to as SIQ, Scholarly Impact Quotient. And um, the idea is that there's a wisdom in the crowd. There's a well-known psychology experiment where you take a, a big jar and you fill it with marbles or some candy or something. And then you ask one or two people to estimate how many pieces of candy or marbles are in the jar. And you get widely disparate numbers. But if you actually ask 50, 100, or 200 people how many, how many marbles are in that jar, you actually end up getting something that is very close to the truth. And it is really refers to what we call the wisdom of the crowd, that with sufficient numbers, large enough people, biases offset each other, and you end up getting something very close to truth. And that's something we feel we're achieving with SIQ. So once published, the world will discover your article inside Curious by virtue of its, of its um, open access standards, by virtue of the Creative Commons license. Uh, we don't worry about copyright. The world has access to your article and it opens up huge potential. As I commented, we are reaching hundreds of thousands of reads in many articles and a couple of few articles approaching even a million reads. That doesn't happen in any other journal. As you'll see, we are across a hybrid between a social media platform and a medical journal. We're proud of that because we think the scale we reach allows us to reach, as you'll see, readers far beyond anything that people are doing today. Now, many of you don't realize this, but the world is trying to move away from the traditional journals you so know, the Elsevier the journals, the nature, the science, which charge readers, which charge libraries for their copyright, access to their copyright. More and more, whether it be the European Union, whether it be the Gates Foundation, uh, have endorsed what's uh, the country of China have endorsed what's called Plan S. The idea is that all published articles should be open to the world. That by a virtue of uh, virtually a human right, we individuals, humanity, have helped create this science. Do we not have a right to the science that we have created, whether it be through our taxes or whether it be as patients participating in clinical trials? So. The world is moving towards open access, and Curious represents by far the lowest cost, most widely distributed open access platform in the world today. How do we keep the cost so low? It's really the technology and the processes that we've incorporated in Curious. Um, many people outside the United States may never heard of TurboTax, but American tax system is one of the most complex and I'm not one of, it is the most complex tax system in the world today. And a lot of people have gotten rich doing people's taxes. But then along came, came TurboTax. And it is a way of online posing specific questions to um, a taxpayer. And by answering these questions, you can fill out even the most sophisticated taxes today. So it's template driven, as is the curious publication model. You answer the questions, you fill in a few boxes, and you publish an article as well as an HTML page. And you do it by, because you've done it yourself, we have our cost can be so low. Moreover, we have a big team of copy, uh, copy editors around the world who jump on and off and do this, you know, when they have the time, when they're available. And they're all extremely qualified, extremely talented, but the flexibility we afford them allows, again, a low cost. 
And then lastly, we have this community engagement, whether it's WeChat or Facebook. The idea is that together, collectively, we can discern quality. And that curation of medical knowledge, we think is unique and has really helped us, helps, helps authors and help the community find the content they want. Well, the proof is in the pudding. Curious over the last seven, eight years is the fastest growing journal in the world today. Okay, we have been growing at between 50 and 100% year over year. And last year we published almost 8,500 articles. Uh, this year we expect to publish between 12 and 14,000 articles. Uh, not only are we publishing more and more articles, but we're publishing, the, these articles are being seen more and more and more. So just inside Curious, we've had this uh, 17 million page views in 2021, and we've had almost a similar number of page views inside PubMed, because all these articles are indexed in PubMed. So uh, this year, we will be approaching close to 40 million article views. So we're growing like crazy. So last year we did 30 million um, article views between uh, Curious and PMC. And we'll, as I said, we'll do more than 40 this year. So this is relentless growth. It's a testament to what open access represents to the world today. And then we're starting now to also see patient views. Traditionally journals were always about physicians, right? Physicians need journals. And in the past, it was only the top percent of physicians that contribute to journals. Now, many more physicians, probably the top 10% of physicians are contributing. And our goal is that almost all physicians in time will contribute to Curious. Meanwhile, we're starting to bring in patient readers. So it's not just professionals that want to read medical content. Patients want access to it as well. And they have, of course, the most at stake of all. So this being the neurosurgery um, the kind of uh, presentation and me being a neurosurgeon, uh, you should know that about 4%, we have now 280,000 kind of members of the curious community today, of which 4% represent neurological neuros neurosurgery. So more than we have more than 10%, uh, 10,000 neurosurgeons on our platform today. And this number, all these numbers are growing at, as I already uh, implied already, about 50% per year. But I try to point out that it's not just neurosurgeons that you as a neurosurgeon might want to reach in your publication. Neurologists, orthopedists, maybe internists, you know, oncologists. So in my world, radiosurgery, I want to read radiation oncologists. And that one of the virtues of, of of curious is it makes it effortless to reach these adjacent specialties. And on a monthly basis, we will send out a specialty specific digest, which includes the best articles in your given specialty. And by the end of this year, we'll be sending out not just specialty, but keyword digest. So if you're interested in, in uh, endoscopic surgery for pituitary tumor, we will send you only those articles if that's what you want. We can make it very precise by virtue of the scale of our network, the number of publications, and the technological foundation that we have. So um, last year, we had 35 million curious page views. We will do close to 50 million this year. Um, importantly, we're a younger age demographic. More than 50% of our readers are, are less than 45. Really, it's 60%. So we're very much a young journal who I think understands and appreciates what technology can do today. And what you're seeing is relentless growth. And we're very much an international journal. About 50% of our user base, our articles come from the United States, but we have a very large following in South Asia growing, growing in, in Japan, and I'm hoping very soon in China, because China really represents an untapped vista for us. Now, I've, you know, China has just a, a, a massive kind of medical system with unparalleled experience in the clinical domain, 
especially neurosurgery. And I'm hoping in this particular talk to reach out to many of the Chinese neurosurgeons that are publishing today, or many that would like to publish, especially reach a worldwide audience. I can't emphasize enough to reach more than half a million, up to a million readers is a true, uh, is a unique opportunity in the medical publishing world. And that's what we enable through our platform. So I um, want you to realize that it is with each and every year, open access publishing is starting to dominate. And uh, we believe that we are the preeminent open access publication in medicine going forward. So much so that we're convinced that in three years, we will be the largest medical journal in the world. We're already among the top five, but based on all our growth, we will be the largest medical journal in the world and give us a whole new degree of influence. In the next three years, we expect to be approaching a million users, a million users. So I invite all of you to kind of think about what I just presented today. And if you have any inclinations to publish in the peer review literature, check out Curious. Um, I think uh, you won't regret you did. So um, with that, um, love to tell you more. If you want to talk to me uh, through my uh, email address or right now, I invite any questions you might have. John? I'm sorry, John. Great, great, great overview of the project. I'm sure there are questions. Uh, okay, we'll open for questions for John from the panel. Harshad, would you like to ask John a question? Hi, John. You presented very well. This is Dr. Harshad Parekh, neurosurgeon from Bombay, India. Perfect. How are you? Have you published yet? I'm good, curious? Good. Yes, I am interested and curious to know more about it and publish it in whenever it's possible. And it seems to be a very, very big platform coming up for uh, all the doctors who are going to be academically interested in publishing all these articles. It looks very, very promising. Great, well, it, great. It's not just promising, it's real. It's, so, uh, it's fulfilling. It's, it's really fun. real. It, I mean, the it way is we... real. I agree with you. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the way we physicians communicate with each other is journals. And um, we, journals, yes. right, if you, if you just talk about, you, you, you throw something on LinkedIn or Facebook, it's, it's interesting, but most of us are skeptical of it until it's undergone peer review. And so the virtue of what we're trying to do is merge social networks and the peer review process and create something special, something unique. I mean, I don't think tomorrow we're going to put the New England Journal of Medicine out of business. So, and that's not really the objective. I mean, there's certainly a role for Lancet where an article may require 10 level, 10 world experts to peer review it before it goes up. And, it, and tomorrow it impacts the way we treat COVID, for example. But 99% of medical knowledge is not of that character. And as you know, neurosurgery is filled with what I refer to as a lot of small science. I mean, what makes a, a great operation isn't one or two things. It's literally hundreds of little things, little tricks that you as a surgeon have learned over the years and stitched together. And we, we want to document what we refer to as small science, because out of small science comes great medicine. And we're convinced of that today. And we're not alone. If you think about anesthesia, as I go back to the New England Journal of Medicine, Mass General, it was the great discovery of a dentist in Hartford, Connecticut that transformed surgery. And yet <laughs> Mass General and New England Journal of Medicine take all the credit. Yeah, you know, John, accessibility excellent, is- Excellent, excellent. Yeah, accessibility is such a big factor with, uh, with the internet and internet makes accessibility so much better. Uh, you're, you're essentially changing the status quo uh, for the last 10 years. Uh, and you did that kind of with this, with the, I was kind of curious, you invented the cyber knife, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, what was it like? What was, you had to do the same thing, essentially. You had to kind of educate people about what the cyber knife is. 
Is this kind of similar in a way, kind of educating people how uh, they can publish online as a, is it similar to the CyberKnife uh, education? It's always, it's always this way with disruptive technologies, you know, and uh, what Gandhi said, you know, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you and then you win. And so it's, you know, it's just, it's, it's always this way with progress. And, uh, and um, you know, I think that it's been a long haul, but now we're winning. And so it's, um, I mean, the trajectory of Curious is clear. And, um, and I'm, you know, unrepentant, we will be the largest medical journal. And so uh, welcome to it. And I'd like you to learn to, to use it and get your way around it. And if you can really follow our rules closely, you get to publish for free, what's better than that, and, uh, and reach a very large audience. So that's my goal today, and especially here in the neurosurgery domain. And of course, I'm now also doing the ZAPX and the ZAPX is a next generation neurosurgery product. But there too, you find resistance. I find resistance from even my old, my CyberKnife people. You know, the, so I created the, um, the monster that's going to create my, that's going to destroy my original child or whatever. But that's progress, right? You've, if you're not willing to see the, th if the ideas of the past replaced with new ideas, you're not really embracing progress. I, I guess going on the days where, uh you Xerox articles and pass it around. Uh, now you can just look at it in your smartphone. You, uh, it's so accessible. Everything is so accessible, which is great. Okay, hey, yeah, Victor, about, go ahead, John, sorry. Yeah, about, it's about 30 to 40% of our articles are read on a smartphone. Yeah, it's such a great tool. Uh, whoever thought of that would arrive, that day would arrive. Victor, welcome. He's a, Victor's a neuroanatomist from Mexico. Victor, do you like hello, to make hello. a comment? Yes, uh, hello, John Bennett. Hello, Victor. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, yes, I am uh, a brain surgeon from Mexico City. So yes. um, uh, thank you so much for uh, your interesting lecture. So um, I think uh, when we are going to write an article, uh, uh, I speak by myself. I think that we want to to make a good or a very good article. Uh, for example, I wrote an article two years ago about the vasculature of the spinal cord, uh, and uh, I, I, uh, most of the times, I think uh, we as uh, brain surgeons want to write an interesting or very interesting articles and do not write uh, a simple, simple uh, article. What's your point of view? Because, you know, there are, uh, I think there are so many articles uh, that are a little bit, a little bit simple and another one could be very, could be, be could be very good articles. What's your, point, what's your point of view about that? Well, I mean, technology has not yet mastered the ability to take an article, um, take a poorly written article and make it well written. Um, so we still do require people to work with editors and we actually will refer them to editors if their article is not good enough. But um, we intend in time to incorporate as AI tools get better to help people write better articles. We will provide the platform, the tools that will create better and better and better articles. And so I think this is, we're still probably a good 10 years away from those tools being accessible, widely accessible, but when they do, you can be sure that Curious will be the first to have those. And so we will make sure that it gets easier and easier and easier to publish and it gets less and less expensive to publish because our goal is to have no barriers to publication or uh, no barriers as long as it's true. There's, don't forget, there are people who want to publish, you know, um, even wrong things, stolen data. There's lots of stuff that happens in the journal world that is not very pretty. And we as a journal have to kind of protect ourselves and our readers. But short of that, anybody who's working hard to publish credible science 
We want to make that easier and easier and easier using better technology and better processes. And we're clearly in the vanguard of it and we're clearly succeeding. The template, Thank you. Thank you. The template seems to make it a lot easier. Could... Yep. Try it. If you try it, you'll, you'll, you'll quickly realize you don't want to publish anywhere else. And when it comes to anatomy, you should know that our most published author is, uh, is Shane Tubbs, the, the current editor in chief of Grace Anatomy. He's in the last 10 years, he's published almost 200 articles. Whoa. So, so the leading anatomist in the world, Shane Tubbs, are, we are his, are his go-to journal. Number Victor, one go-to journal. Victor, you probably know him, right? Well, Victor, you know Shane Tubbs, right? Earlier. I'm thank sure you, thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, more well, questions. Antonio Vallejo um, uh, asked about how can this benefit uh, multidisciplinary scientific publications? Well, um, it just directly does. I mean, we, we enable scientific publications, whether they be multidisciplinary or unidisciplinary, to happen faster and ideally for no or low cost. So um, we are, I mean, I think of the journal, think of Curious as being a little like Facebook or LinkedIn or one of these social media sites that make it so much easier to put up information almost instantaneously. Now we don't allow instantaneous publication because it has to go under, has to undergo peer review and peer review is how we get rid of the nonsense. We keep nonsense out of the site by peer review. And of course, that peer review process then lets us be indexed by the National Library of Medicine and, and Scopus and the other big indexing sites. So it's we, we again, believe in peer review, but also are very, uh, have great admiration for social media. And so what we try to do is make something special. And in the end, it's not just the content, it's the network. We are growing a network that is second to none. And I would love to see you all being part of our network, especially some people from China, which I'd love to start uh, incorporating in our network even more. We only have a small handful of Chinese publications, but uh, given the scale of China, there's uh, so much growth to be had there. Yeah, we're having a talk tomorrow night, as you know, John, with the Chinese Neurosurgical Journal. It's a little early for you. We got you up early today. We're not going to get you up at five o'clock tomorrow. But uh, uh, anyways, yeah, I hope you can uh, bring your ideas in front of them. At, at any rate, um, can you talk a little bit about your patient section that you're starting at Curious? Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing there involving well, patients? Um, it's only um, it's embryonic, but... Okay. Um, but the um, mere idea that patients are part of the audience for peer review publications is kind of heretical. Uh, no one has ever looked at journals in that light. However, I can tell you in my clinical practice over the years, some of my uh, most sophisticated patients always brought medical journals in, <coughs> always brought um, peer-reviewed articles into my clinic and would, you know, question me uh, through peer with peer-reviewed uh, articles in front of them, which um, I was most amused by, but I, I enjoyed it. In some way, it was an interesting way to have to justify my recommendations, you know, using the peer-reviewed uh, literature. So um, I think the number of patients who do that is very small, probably just a one or two percent. But that's in large part because articles have been written in a way that makes it very hard for most patients to understand. We use very arcane language. We use lots of abbreviations and we don't do a good job of explaining ourselves in our articles because we assume that only our, our, our colleagues are reading them. But I think as we open up the journal world more and more, and we're seeing a little of this, our authors are starting to write in a more digestible manner believing that there will be, uh, will be readers that are less sophisticated than their colleagues. And where we're seeing a little bit of this really catch fires in the, uh, in the uh, 
a cosmetic surgery domain where plastic surgeons want to demonstrate their capabilities, not just to colleagues, they really want to demonstrate it to patients. And so they're going out of their way to make this stuff very understandable. And then lastly, we have something called a patient reported outcomes section, which we have not really driven to the extent it should be. But if you look at enough curious articles, you'll see some of these. And this is where a scientific publication is accompanied by a patient reporting their own clinical experience with a given procedure or drug. So this is a chance for not only physicians to tell the story of why something works or doesn't work, but a way in parallel for the patients to tell what they experienced in getting that treatment. We refer to it as a patient reported outcome. And Curious does enable that, but to date, it, we've not driven it. And I think you'll see this, we'll start a light a fire under this particular category of publication in the years to come because patients are inter kind of interested in what doctors have to say about a procedure, but oftentimes they're even more interested in what other fellow patients have to say. And when that has undergone peer review, then it really has a measure of truth that is unparalleled in the publication industry. I didn't expect to hear about that today. And it's, it's nice. Giang Bot, we have a question from Giang Bot. Go ahead, Giang. Uh, thank you very much for the lecture. I've been interested. I'm um, a Nigerian neurosurgeon. I was opportune to be in the AANS meeting in Tel Aviv in 2013, where authors, I mean, uh, journal editors were presenting. And in child nervous system, about 10% was coming from Africa. And in actor neurochirurgia, uh, about 1%. I was uh, also privileged to be in CNS conference in 2015. And uh, it was very painful to me, and uh, it almost brought me to tears when the editor of the Journal of Neurosurgery was presenting, um, I mean, journals coming from all over, and he presented it in a map. And the whole of Africa was almost gray because most of where the articles were coming were, were in red. The whole of Africa, except maybe Egypt and maybe a dot in South Africa. So uh, I would like to ask, because some of the things we cannot present are very modern things, because some of our things are still basic. Uh, what would be your advice to authors from Africa in terms of encouraging them? And also, how frequent are these publications? Because I know some of the journals would come, I mean, once in a month or thereabouts. So I would be glad to uh, hear from you about Africa and uh, how you would want to encourage Africans and uh, what, uh, if you have other, other things. Thank you, sir. Well, a great comment and, and wonderful question. Um, you're right, uh, Africa is underrepresented in medical journals in general. Um, and it's, it is underrepresented and curious, but we publish a fair number of African authors, um, many from Nigeria, more from Northern Africa, um, and uh, South Africa as well. But uh, certainly you'll, you'll find that the author base of Curious is more diverse than just about any other journal you'll ever meet. <clears throat> I I don't know if the exact number of countries represented, but it's like 150 different countries have been published in Curious. So we, um, I invite you to do it in part because you'll find we're utterly open to African authors. We don't require that the work that, be, that is published has to be done in, in world-class expensive laboratories that only Harvard and Stanford can afford. Um, there are, as you heard me say, we believe that there are humble observations that come out of practicing physicians that have tr world transformational ideas. And, and I like to talk, and many times when I talk about Curious, I like to talk about 
HIV. I like to talk about the fact that HIV festered as a disease in Africa for two generations. I mean, the exact timing is not clear, but 50, 60, 70 years or something like that. And the disease was never reported in Africa, even though perhaps a millions, of, we don't know exactly, but it's like it could be well over a million patients were being treated in Africa at clinics and the disease was never reported until it got to San Francisco and New York. And something is clearly wrong with our ability to tap into new medical knowledge. Clearly there were doctors in Africa that said, something's not right. This is, I think there was a called the thin man disease or they had a specific name in some countries in Africa for HIV, but it was never reported until it got to the United States and New York and, 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 and San Francisco. So that shows you there's something very wrong with the journal world. And we at Curious think that that's much less likely to happen now that Curious is around. But great question. Very good. Okay, any more questions from the panel? Okay, John, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time. And, uh, and we'll be keeping in touch in, uh, about China. So, and thanks, thanks, all, thanks all the people for coming. Maybe I'll see you guys in Curious as well. Okay. okay. Take care, guys. Thank thanks, you. Bye-bye.